What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Accounting Flow podcast brought to you by Financial Sense. This podcast is dedicated to taking a deep dive into accounting firm workflow and processes. Each episode, we will spend 20 minutes interviewing actual accounting firm owners just like you, uncovering specific processes that firm owners and operators encounter on a daily basis and discuss ways to improve them. Let's go. All right. I am super excited to chat with two people today. We got a bonus. So we've got Dave Kirsting and we've got Tanya Schulte here to talk to us about co-firming, what co-firming is, how to approach it, and ways that you could think about implementing co-firming in your business. Uh, Dave, Tanya, welcome. Really excited to be here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so excited to have both you guys on today. Um, real quick, let's go into your backgrounds. Just your quick high level elevator pitch of who you are. Dave, you want to you wanna start us off? Sure. My name is Dave Kirsting. I'm with Capabaria. We're based out of Denver, Colorado, but uh, as most of us are, uh, we are a national firm. Our focus is on bookkeeping. Um, 75, 75% of us uh, is construction. Um, the rest of it is really about concierge consulting, which kind of helps us stand out um, in the accounting arena. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Roman. Um, yeah, I'm Tanya Schulte. I founded the Profit Constructors about almost eight years ago, which is super exciting that it's been nearly that long ago. Um, but my whole background has all been in construction accounting. I started doing construction accounting in 1997, actually. I might be dating myself a little bit there. But we'll that. Um, yeah, I absolutely love this sector and serving this industry. And um, that's all that I've ever done. And it's really, it's exciting, I think, because there's so much new technology coming into this space. So I love it. Good. So if you have any job costing questions, Tanya is your woman. <laughs> yeah. um, what, a, what a great niche to be in. I love that you're hyper focused. Um, Tanya, could you give us a quick overview, like a definition of what co-firming is? Sure. I think co-firming, a lot of people hear it and they think it's one of two things. So I'm going to start with what it's not, right? A lot of people think it's like collaboration where two firms maybe share ideas and help each other in just like high level ideas of like, here's how we do things. Let me share with you some best practices. Some people think it's that. Other people think it's straight subcontracting, right? Like here, I got a job. I want Dave to just do the job. I'm just going to basically be the general contractor and he's going to be the subcontractor. It is like that. It's kind of like subcontracting, but it's more than that because um, besides the fact that I'm parceling some parts of the work out to Dave and his team or some of the other co-forming partners that we have, we are also sharing the load of the work. There are times where our team will step in and do pieces of the work that are, are parts of the work we've actually already parceled out to Dave's team. But we're also sharing team meetings, team trainings, um, and an overall team culture between all of our co firm partners. Okay, so it is far deeper than a traditional like subcontracting type relationship. Dave, did, do you have anything to add to that? Well, well, I do. I mean, you, you, you do have to look at it as we're one big team. Instead of being separation and you're in our client's mind, the client understands there's two firms involved, but we act as one. Um, and, you know, when we say we're shared on everything, we're talking about even the financial piece, the, the income coming in from, from the client is, is, is determined on who gets what based on the, the lift and load um, that is happening. But, you know, there are key pieces to, to what Tanya's firm does versus what my firm does or some of the other firms that work with us, because there might be three of three firms involved instead of just two. And it just mm-hmm. depends. Again, what we're bringing to this client is we know somebody. We're going to connect that dot and we're going to bring in this professional and it's going to be a part of your team. Um, and that team it doesn't mean I come in and, oh, I'm going to work on this one piece. Well, now I'm done and I back out. No, I'm still in it. And I'm, I'm there. So if there's a question three months from now, I'm still able to answer and assist. Yeah. Boy, I have so many questions as it relates to internal operations, how it impacts the client, how your team members interact. But let's let's start, um, you know, with a scenario of a, a traditional CAS practice. Um, if, if a CAS practice is starting to entertain the idea of co-firming, um, how do they get started with that? How do they determine what elements of their firm needs to be co-firmed? Like, where do you even start? Tanya, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah. I will say, <laughs> I've told this story a few times. The way that Dave and I started doing it was out of sheer desperation on my part. <laughs> Um, and it was kind of cool because it was perfect timing for both Dave and I, right? Like I had just signed one of the largest clients that our firm had ever signed. And at the same time, our operations manager of the time told me that he was leaving. Yeah. And so I was actually at my business coach's office, um, doing some year end, like plan for the next year strategy meetings. And, uh, we happened, uh, Dave and I happened to share the same business coach and he was like, well, you know, I have a gentleman who's wanting to hire someone. He's been trying to increase capacity at his firm, but he hasn't quite found the right way to do that. This might be the, the best fit, right? He could go ahead and increase capacity for his firm, take on this client along alongside you, and you guys could go for it. And the reason that it sort of grew into co-firming for us was because there were some aspects of the job costing piece that Dave and his team didn't quite know how to do yet. And so I said, well, I'll train you guys. And so instead of it just being a standard, let me just subcontract out the work and you guys, you handle it all, you do every bit of it, that training component was born in this. And honestly, I think that's what's made it so amazing and so valuable is that we started to figure out what we needed was the training and the teamwork alongside just the actual technical work getting done. And I think what you see, I think what you see too in, in adding in is that, you know, as my firm started learning the things, you know, or as I say, the way that Tanya's firm does it, you know, being the one of the top experts in construction, you know, there were pieces that my firm brought to the table that that she wasn't aware of. And what we also, again, coming back to the client, and why would the client want two firms involved? Um, again, is this different level of expertise between mm -hmm. both firms. Um, you know, Tanya can sit and go through the, you know, work in progress reporting, and here's the job costing and all these things. Um, and then my team kind of comes in with the HR piece and the, the workman's comp and the GL, and but also knowing that, hey, we know how to do the day-to-day, -day, um, and we're prepping and getting all your monthly stuff done. We're helping put together, and this is the most important piece I have to say, processes, mm. helping to, to get the client out of their own way so that we can focus on what is the plan for you and where you're going to be. But now it's not, again, one firm or one person thinking, it's 10 people, 15 yeah. people working on one, one area to focus on. Yeah, you're able to to amplify the impact that your team is capable of having alongside of another firm that ultimately maximizes client experience because now they have access to a multitude of resources across the firms. Correct. Yeah, I think one of the things to, to more specifically answer your original question, Roman, about how someone could get into this, one of the things to think about is how are you currently really able to serve your clients well? Hmm. And in what areas are your weaknesses. Look for firms that can fill in those spots where your firm is weak. I, I like that a lot because if you're familiar with, um, you know, uh, strength finders, different assessments, you know, say double down on your strengths oftentimes um, and identify places where you can, can almost subsidize the weaknesses via things like co-firming. And so, okay, we've identified um, our weaknesses perhaps. And, and I believe there are three, three different outcomes that a firm could approach. They could, they could buy a practice that does that. They could build it internally or they could partner. That last bit is here what we're talking about on the co-firming front. And so if I've identified my weaknesses, now where do I even go? Do I just call up my industry partners and say, hey, do you want to co-firm? You know, how does that next step work then once you've identified this could be an area in our business where we could look at co-firming? And I think that when we start to look at it, you know, uh, as you said earlier, you know, search co-firming and, and there's there's such a multitude of things that come out of it, but it may not be answering the question you need. So Tanya and I are, are, are reaching out to the communities, letting people know we're heavily involved in the community called Roundtable Labs. And we're trying to make sure that, that people in that group know and that they're spreading the news um, on what we do and why we do it. Um, is it the, oh, yeah, everybody come to us and we're the co-firmers and, you know, we're, we're it? No, there's a lot of people that already do co-firming, just may not be labeling co-firming um, or, or making a business out of it um, and really trying to hone in that, you know, we want to share, share what we do with everybody because there's work for everyone. Yeah. And so, so I'm hearing you talking about community 
and and re- leaning into community in terms of finding a potential partner that could support you in that. Um, is that are there other avenues that somebody could go through to identify? Okay, I I'm in need of X service, and other firm is in need of of you know capable of providing X service, but also capable of fulfilling Y problem. Um, where do you go to to identify that those individuals that could support you in that that problem? I think community is the number one spot, right? There's a couple of things that Dave and I have talked about at length since we sort of started our experiment that has grown and grown and grown because now we have about four co-firm partner firms that all work together um, under one umbrella, which is happens to be right now the TPC, the Profit Constructors umbrella. Um, but one of the big things that we have talked about is that every one of the relationships that are a part of that co-firming um, partnership were born from community And they almost had to be because we had to first know one another and understand the shared values. Because Mm -hmm. one of the things I do not want to do is uh, align our firm with a firm that doesn't share our values and therefore Mm -hmm. not necessarily bring the same level of service or those same values to our client relationship. Yeah, and part of that also includes, you know, what is that level of commitment that the other firm is bringing in? Um, what are their vision values? Um, and, you know, at what level of their firm are they wanting to co-firm? So, like, mm-hmm. again, in my firm, we're, we're probably 30, 40% in co-firming and the rest is, is just here at Capivario. But the goal is, is for us to co-firm. Um, but it's also having that understanding that, you um, what, what Tanya and I are trying to do also is p- p- position someone in our firms that is reviewing the work of these other firms, as we call it quality control, to mm-hmm. ensure that what's going to the client is exactly what is in our mission. Yeah, I, I love that you all brought that up, um, particularly because when you're, when you're evaluating partners, um, oftentimes when you're getting into an arrangement with a vendor, a partner, what have you, um, there's always a deal. There's a transaction occurring and not all the times is it is it 50-50, is it totally equitable? And so you want to avoid the situations in which, where there's an imbalance in, in mission or values or even the monetary exchange. And so once you've identified a problem, you have community and identified a potential partner in there, how do you, how do you start to then negotiate an arrangement between firms? <laughs> One of the very first things that we were just, again, fortunate to have in this scenario was our, our shared business coach who helped us do mm-hmm. that. And ever since then, we have preached that as best practice, right? Mm-hmm. Like have some third party person who's not necessarily going to be a part of this arrangement, help you negotiate the deal. Because mm-hmm. um, as our business coach put it at the time, we would have, Dave and I would have just niced each other to death. <laughs> And just, oh, what could go wrong? We love each other. It's, it's all great, right? Um, but he really helped us to see and think through, like, putting together uh, a model and a contract that was going to work for all parties and asking us all of the questions, like, what if someone decides they don't want to co-firm anymore? What if a client decides they don't like one of the co-firming partners? Like, all of these upfront questions that you're going to need to work through and understand what your response is going to be to that before it happens. So having that third party negotiate that for you I think is uh, invaluable. And I I like to call it, you know, having the prenup ready um, or the divorce paperwork already filled out. You know, what is it going to look like if the worst happens? Um, But, you know, Tanya and I have experienced over the last two years, there have been situations where a client liked my firm or not her firm or vice versa, or they liked a person in our firm and not a person somebody else in my own firm. Um, And how do we handle those situations? Or they're going to Tanya because they're complaining about somebody on my team. You know, who is in charge? How are we making this decision together? Um, But also who's in, who's ultimate in charge? Who's gonna make this decision? Um, But what happens if the relationship that Tanya and I have in co-firming now brings on another client because of a referral? Well, where did that client come from? Well, what it depends on where the original lead came from. You know, if it came from Tanya's firm, then don't I owe her something for that now new client that may or may not be in co-firming? So we got to put those things on paper. We got to help people understand this is what our integrity says we should be doing. And to, together, we're here to take care of each other's teams and each other's pocketbooks, but also our clients. Because, you know, the profit constructors is, you know, uh, uh, ride with the big dogs. 
um, you know, or run with the big dog, sorry. <laughs> and then Capivario is we get you, we got you. You know, you put those together. We're elevating your company to be with the big people and the, and the big companies. Well, we understand who you are and we've got you back. Um, and I think that it just flows. Yeah, but it also sounds like there's an increased level of administration, an increased level of kind of awareness and attention that needs to be paid between uh, not only the co-firming resources, but also the clients that are experiencing that service. And so do, do you have a, a process or a framework that you utilize to communicate, to manage like those referrals that you mentioned? You know, How do you guys establish that framework to make sure from the beginning that you're setting off on the right track? That's a part of what we're actually talking about right now, right? Because originally there was just sort of this idea like as clients come across TPC's um, channels, all of our lead channels that we'll just sort of hand them out to the, um, the co-forming partners. But as you mentioned, Roman, one of the things that's become quite apparent over the way that this has grown is that there's a higher level of administrative need. Um, and a higher level of just overarching understanding of how do those leads flow through to the co-forming partners, right? So um, it, it, like any other growing concern, we are, we've gone through some growing pains and we're going through that growing pain right now. So Dave mentioned, we actually at the Profit Constructors hired a quality assurance manager whose job it is to manage all of the co-formed relationships. And she... Um, deals with each one of the co-farm partners in a little bit of a different way, just because of how those co-farm partners work, right? Um, but ultimately, her goal is to make sure that by the time information is flowing back to the client, it looks the same every time, regardless of who's doing the work. Hmm. But because of that, we also now in, ended up increasing what we're sort of charging the co-farm partners. So where we had had agreements in place, all the co-farm partners agreed to this as well. But we have said, okay, there's an administrative fee almost now that has to also come off of, of what is flowing back to you for this work. So, and they all were in agreement with that because they love the fact that they're not having to do so much quality assurance anymore, right? Like it's flowing through one organization and they can just sort of trust that she's doing her job and reviewing all the work. So it's, again, it's, it flows both ways and all of the partners really enjoy it and like it, but it, but just like everything else in business, that quality assurance manager comes at a cost. Yeah. And I think that it not only a cost, but we also have to look at how do we how do we have a quality control manager or managers um, and stay consistent? How are we staying consistent in their world? Like my firm uses X Y Z apps to do my job, and Tanya's firm uses a whole different grouping of apps. We had to decide um, as co-firming groups. We had to decide this is going to be what our apps are. So as mm. you know, Tanya has been using for forever, financial sense. Financial sense became the core of our co-firming business. We all have financial sense. We might also have it for our own firms, but we have it for the co-firming world that is, we all have access to it. We all pay, pay for it ourselves. And we all make sure that that the templates are the same, that what we're doing between one client and another is the same to make that quality control um, a little easier. So now think about the other 20,000 apps that could be connected to co-firming or, or to your firm and doing the work. Again, that is the conversation where um, currently um, in our current structure, TPC holds all of that co-firming information and then we kind of all join in, you know, again, we're hoping by the beginning of next year, we're going to have this new excitement um, in a company called APN that will kind of help us uh, take over and, and even expand more into this world of co-firming. Um, but right now it's, it's like you said, how do we, how do we identify our needs? How do we get through the growing pains and how do we learn? You know, over the last two years, we've learned a lot with just being me and Tanya. Um, and now bringing on these other firms over the last year, we're like, holy cow, it worked for me and Tanya. This is not really working for five more people. Like, how do we streamline even more? Okay, Dave and Tanya, my, my brain is just spinning right now on, on co-firming. And I'm, this is awesome. Um, so two things that, that came out to me that I'd love to hit on. One, you mentioned the importance of having an aligned tech stack. And so that almost being a prerequisite of jumping into a co-framing relationship, ensuring that there's alignment on what's being utilized going forward to ensure consistency for the client. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's really jumping out is, is almost just a shared services model, because it sounds like there's almost been to some degree, a new firm, a new entity that sprung up of these shared resources that are now being allocated and managed almost independently. 
And so at what point does it just become super firm supported by four in independent firms? That's a good question. That's what we're trying to figure out as we speak about this right now, because um, yeah. And, and the other part of that Roman that we're trying to sort of suss out and pull out of this amazing relationship is um, how does super firm interact with those firms? And how does each of those firms also still remain autonomous? Because mm -hmm. each of the firms has the desire right now as, as, with all the firms that we're working with, they all have their desire to remain autonomous. One piece of it is that um, not every client comes with the right set of, um, of desirable things to be a co-firm client, right? So whether that's they don't have high enough revenue, so there's not going to be enough skin in the game for all the co-firm partners to get a little piece of that. Or um, maybe it's just like in, in the current scenario, TPC, the profit constructors is only taking on construction clients, right? So perhaps some of the other co-firm partner clients want something outside of construction. So that's not going to run through the co-firm scenario in the current situation. So part of that has just been saying, okay, all of these partner firms wish to maintain some autonomy and have their own set of clients. So they're going to get the first referrals from the super firm, right? Yeah. So that's a little piece. So there's just all of these um, parts and pieces to how that's going to work that we're just now trying to put together. And, and I think you can add, add one more piece to that, you know, again, you know, not just talking about leads because each firm has their own set of leads, but, and we each get to identify our lead. Like, Hey, I have this lead and I look at it as if I have a lead in construction, it's going to co-firming if all the other things work. If it, if it doesn't get that far, then, Hey, it's going to stay here, but I might reach out at ad hoc, you know, or, you know, as a, as a collaborative environment instead of co-firming um, until it needs to be. Um, but more importantly is, what is that super firm offering to all of the co-firms? So all the, what, what are they getting out of it besides leads and work? They're also getting a lot of training. So like we talked about earlier, you know, uh, Tanya is the expert in work in progress. She is amazing at, at job costing and trying to figure out where things need to be. Now imagine a tiny firm or a solopreneur or even a firm with five or six employees, who, uh, you know, they just aren't the experts. TPC, APN, Capivari, we're all going to get together and we're going to do a training course and we're going to continue that training course um, and teach more than what you might need. So again, another, uh, shall we say, a version of a community that has a sub-community um, that really understands what are we trying to do um, and how do we involve other people um, that maybe we don't have the lead to give to yet, but hey, do you want to learn from us um, until we get to there? Um, so I think that really helps. Not even just the trainings. I want to throw one other thing out there that every single one of the firm owners has found, again, completely invaluable in this experience is the idea that we're, we do what we call open office hours as an entire team of co-firm partners and everybody can just come and it's for firm owners. It's also for their team members. Um, but firm owners especially have said what relief it is to have other firm owners who are in their same shoes to not, again, to not just collaborate. It's a strange and new idea that we're actually like leading our firms jointly and together. I don't even know how to describe that, Roman, but it's, it's been so freeing and helpful for all of us as firm owners. Yeah. And we it's can talk so about more than just the co-firming jobs. So there's been times where I'm in this open office hours. And I'm like, hey, I have this client over here that none of you know, and this is my problem. How do I solve this? And so that's collaborative, um, you know, but at the same time, co-firming, we're all there from all the other firms. Doesn't mean that I'm working on the same clients they are. Um, and so we get to bring this, this extra piece of excitement um, or like Tanya did, uh, we had a client or she had a client um, on her side that, they just had like simple questions, workman's comp, their workman's comp insurance is renewing. I'm an expert in that. Boom, we're on Slack, we're talking. Next thing you know, here's some policies, here's some ideas, go. And, you know, all happened within a four day time frame before their deadline. You know, like how, who has that access to, 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 to do that? Not a lot of people that have been like, I don't know, let's call somebody. Let's figure that out. What a massive benefit to to the team, to the employees, to, to like recruitment and retention of folks to have that resource available to them. Um, that's, that's awesome. It, it also reminds me of one of my favorite phrases that I'm a massive evangelist for, but it's build together, go farther. 
and, and genuinely, when you are in community, when you're building alongside of others, it is far more powerful than just prompting chat GPT of how to get something done more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, okay, with about five minutes left here, so I think we're gonna have a part two, by the way, because I wanna <laughs> keep going on this. But with about five minutes left here, um, I wanna go through a scenario of um, you know, a standard CAS practice, a firm owner who's listening to this, um, say they offer accounting bookkeeping solutions, uh, solutions but no, no tax. Um, but they're interested in potentially co-firming on tax because their clients ask about it. Um, they have some degree of community. What would be your recommendation to start that conversation with another firm? Uh, well, I think that, again, you know, right now we don't do tax in on our co-firming world. Doesn't mean we can't. Um, it doesn't mean it's not going to be coming. Um, but I think that what we have started so far um, has been asking the, the CPA firm that does tax, what do you need from me as a bookkeeping firm, counting firm? What is, do you have a checklist of things that you're going to ask me every time so that we can kind of help do that? Um, and then then want to partner with them. You know what? Hey, I know it's about, it's about opening a conversation. I know that you have bookkeeping work that you need done. You're swamped as a tax professional during these time frames. I just happen to be a little slower during that time frame with all this extra stuff I have. Can, can we work a co-firming world where maybe throughout the year I can keep you where you need to be at staffing levels and flex as you need to flex? Um, and I think that's kind of the, the first part. Again, community conversation. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to throw out there that last year, Dave and I had a similar conversation at QuickBooks Connect. We were in a roundtable um, opportunity at QuickBooks Connect where we were talking about this. And a lady at the table where I was sitting said, oh, I do this. I co-firm with a CPA practice in our town. But as we talked about it, really all that they did was they would have like the same shared clients, right? So as we dove more into what co-firming really was and how Dave and I do it, it opened up a whole new world for her. And she said, and I, I would love to hear, maybe I'll see her again at QuickBooks Connect this year, but I would love to hear the rest of her story because she said, I'm going to go back and talk to the CPA firm that I do this with, sort of, and talk to them about a more cohesive environment where we're actually working together as a team rather than just sharing some clients. So. Yeah, it's not a one-off. It's not a one-off here. Let me just do this yeah. for this minute and give it back. Yeah. It's I'm going to be working with you, client A, while CPA tax firm is also working with client A, while firm is working with with you know with CPA firm all year. You know, so where we're strategizing together, we're right. showing up. My firm is showing up to the CPA meeting with the client to hear about what their tax exposure looks like. What are things that we can do to help? You know, how do we organize better for the client? Um, or what things do we need to red flag or call out to the CPA in February instead of in December mm -hmm. um, so that they can make some pivots or, or, or movement? Um, so that's that's co-firming. <laughs> it's, it's powerful. It's powerful because, you, you know, most firms out there have partners in the space, referral partners that they send other work to that maybe isn't right down their alley. And, and those partners may be a great starting point of maybe, yeah. maybe starting to walk down the path of like, what could this look like if we were to expand the relationship? And then from there, uh, identifying tech stack, from there, evaluating how could this operate tactically with our clients? How is it managed? How is it, uh, how's quality assurance occur? Things like that. And so um, this is, quite fascinating. Um, are there are there resources out there that exist? You know, I haven't found much online that talks about co-firming, co but where should people go to research this and learn more? Any suggestions? They can call us. <laughs> they can, yeah, for sure. Call, call, call Capivario, email us, you get on our website, get on the Profit Constructors website, you know, connect with us because we are talking, we will be at QuickBooks Connect and Scaling New Heights where we're talking about co-firming a lot. Um, and, you know, we, we, we would love for you to come chit chat with us um, some more about it. Um, you know, in addition, I'm sure you can ask anybody at Financial Sense um, about co-firming because as we said earlier, Financial Sense is our, is our hub for, for what we do. Um, and, I, and I think that once we made that decision, um, our, our relationship has been easier because all that, that just task like stuff and deadlines and requests to clients, it's done. Now we can focus on the real important things. And I know um, it's another, at least one other co-firming partnership that does it with Financial Sense as well. So I, I think Financial Sense has a good handle on what, what we're asking for and what, what our needs are. Okay. Okay. So you, you heard it here. Uh, they said to reach out directly to Tanya and to Dave on this matter if you're interested in co-firming. Um, if they wanted to do that, how would they reach you, Tanya? 
they can just email me, Tanya at theprofitconstructors.com. I'm always down. I will say this. I had the greatest mentors and helpers and friends and partners when I started my own firm. And I'm always here to pay that forward. Perfect. How about you, Dave? Uh, so you can do the same. You can email me or get on my website and send it in through uh, the website. But it's Dave at Capobario.com. Perfect. Um, you might hear from some folks on this because it piques my interest a lot. I know that a lot of people are interested in this subject. Uh, I really hope that we can jump in on a part two here soon because um, this is fascinating. It's novel. And when you build together, you go farther, right? Um, so I thank you both very much for this, this conversation. Um, accounting flow is better because of it. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. For listening in today, if you enjoyed this podcast, forget to share and write a review. This is going to help other firm owners just like you find our podcast and get insights into how to grow their firm. Stay tuned.